lead on the Hack NYC project, which is a kinetic ICS hacking platform that uh, debuted at DEF CON 2019. And interesting, before getting into tech, Mark was in the music business, working with such bands like Nirvana and the Beastie Boys. So without further ado, please take it away, Mark. Great, thanks, Sam. <clears throat> Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, you know, we've got, um, we've got a really uh, interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'm excited uh, for uh, geeking out about cyber stuff with some really smart and experienced people. Um, before I uh, introduce the panelists, um, I just want to spend a few minutes um, setting the stage a little bit for um, what's happening in, in cybersecurity uh, in the big picture, um, how you can train to get into this field, um, and also talk a little bit about um, something we're really excited about, which is launching a new cybersecurity boot camp uh, there in Baton Rouge with our, our friends from Louisiana State uh, University. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay, so let's uh, start start at the top. And I think the, the headline here um, is that it's pretty bad out there. And I'm, I'm gonna read some of this, this text out, right? But um, you read it in the news every day. Another huge hack or data breach. The fact is there's a war being waged in cyberspace right now. Uh, and the white hats are losing to the black hats. And this is happening on a massive scale as cyber crime will cost the world $6 trillion annually by next year. We need more white hats. Companies and governments are struggling to keep pace with the dramatic rise in cybercrime. They're trying to hire people with cyber skills, but there is a critical shortage, a critical shortage of them in the US and around the world. There will be three and a half million cybersecurity jobs open by next year. Throw a couple st statistics out there. Um, one, the demand for cybersecurity experts is growing 12 times faster than the current US job market, making cybersecurity one of the most highly sought after careers in the country. And cybersecurity professionals have an average salary that's three times higher than the national average. <clears throat> but first you need to train grasshopper, right? And, and one question that uh, we get a lot is, how long will it take um, to get the required skills to enter this field as a practitioner in cybersecurity? And the answer is, it depends, right? It depends on how you do it. And there's different ways you can train, right? So maybe um, you're looking at taking un an undergraduate degree in cybersecurity. It's going to take you about, about four years. Maybe you've already got a, a, an undergrad in, let's say, computer science, and you want to do a master's in uh, cybersecurity. It's going to take you about two years. Uh, maybe you want to self-study. Uh, not easy, but it's possible. Um, we can talk more about that in, in the Q&A if anyone's interested. It's going to take 12, 18, maybe 24 months um, to learn what you need to know. Or if you want to accelerate um, your training, you can look to do a, a security boot camp. Um, either part-time, it's going to take you about six months, or, or full-time, it's going to take you about three months. Um, and as I mentioned in the, in the opening, um, we're really excited to be launching a new cybersecurity boot camp um, with Louisiana State University. Um, and I'll just give you some headlines about this program, right? The, the idea is um, to, that you'll be learning the, uh, the offensive and defensive cybersecurity skills in demand by the world's top companies and organizations. And the reason we teach uh, offense um, is to develop um, what we call the security mindset. Most of the jobs are on defense or what we call blue team, but you have to develop something called the security mindset to be a better defender. And that's why we teach offensive security as well. Uh, there's no previous experience uh, or knowledge in cybersecurity that's uh, required. As part of the program, you'll receive professional development assistance, things like uh, resume, networking, and interview guidance um, to jumpstart your career in, in cybersecurity. And I, I know there's a word here, lucrative. Um, that is true. We can, we can talk more about that in the Q&A, um, but I would look at the lucrative aspect of InfoSec as sort of a side benefit. It should not be uh, your primary reason for going into this uh, field. And then at the end of the program, um, you would attend a job fair that connects you with cyber uh, industry uh, employers and leaders eager to hire graduates um, from the program. With the goal, real simple, right? If you go through a boot camp like this, you're going to want to get hired at the end of the program. Typically, that's going to be as what we call a security analyst. So uh, in terms of the course format, um, for the full-time program, it's uh, weekdays, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It is a live online program. 
And for the part-time program, it's uh, two nights per week, 6.30 to 9.30, um, and Saturday morning for four hours. That, the part-time program is also live online. So just some important dates uh, to note before we get into the panel discussion. Um, the first uh, part-time class starts in July and runs for six months. The first full-time class also starts in July, so they both start about a month from now. Um, if you want to apply for either of these programs, uh, the deadline is June 29th. And if you want to learn more about uh, either one of these programs, then I would invite you to go to uh, an info session, which we'll be hosting with LSU on June uh, 24th. And you can also go to the website. You see the URL there, um, and I'll ask Sam to post it in the, in the chat as well um, to either apply for the program or register for the, for the info session. So let's get into it, right? Really excited for this, this uh, conversation. Um, before I introduce the panelists, let me tell you a little bit about them. Um, so first of all, uh, Colonel Benjamin Bourgoin um, has over 30 years of, of service in the US Army Reserves, currently assigned as the commander of the Army Reserves Cyber Protection Brigade he oversees the training and deployment of 562 cyber warriors in support of the U.S. National Military Strategy for Cyber Operations. In the civilian sector, he is employed as a cybersecurity consultant, conducting security risk assessments and assisting clients in developing or improving cybersecurity risk management functions. His education includes a bachelor's in history from LSU, a master's in IT from Nova Southeastern University, and a Master's of Science in Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. We also have uh, Keeson Girardi with us. Uh, Keeson is a Senior Cybersecurity Solutions Consultant with over 23 years experience in the information technology and cybersecurity sectors. A former Black Hat hacker, we're going to dive into that in the conversation, it's very interesting stories that, that Keeson can share, and Black Hat reverse engineer Mr. Drawdy has an extensive cybersecurity background with firsthand significant knowledge in defeating secure networks and physical vectors and deep exposure to all aspects of cloud storage, security, and encryption. Encryption is a really important part of the InfoSec world. We can talk about that in, in the Q&A if people are interested. In his career path as both a VP of IT at SMG Media, as well as various cybersecurity roles with the Department of Energy and Environment, Duck Creek Technologies, Olenek and CME Group, he has managed global teams of IT professionals throughout the US, uh, Israel, UK, and Asia. And we also have Bill Leach with us. Uh, Bill is the Vice President of Information Technology, Security, and Government Services at Transformix. Bill has been working within the fields of information assurance, cybersecurity, and compliance since 1986 starting with the United States Navy in electronic intelligence security. During his military career, he advanced to the senior enlisted ranks and earned his commission while graduating from the University of Auburn in 1996. Bill had four tours of duty as the information assurance manager for the Navy, Navy Reserve Forces Command and was responsible for the certification and accreditation of over 600 reserve centers across the United States. Bill's expertise is primarily in information assurance, cybersecurity, with specializations in healthcare, financial, and government sectors. So with that, let me um, stop sharing my screen and welcome you guys. Hey, guys. Hello. Hello. Hey, Mark. Well, uh, you know, I would just say to anybody uh, listening and, and watching, um, if this isn't an, an impressive group, I, I don't know what is, particularly in, in InfoSec. And you know we've we've just read um, your bios, your your official bios. But it would be great to kind of hear it um, in your own words, um, your your story, how you got started in in cybersecurity, and your path to get you to where you are uh, today. So Benjamin, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you. Um, I first like to thank you for having me here today. It's an honor and a, a pleasure to uh, help you uh, develop the future cyber security professionals. Um, I got started in uh, IT back in 2000 as a uh, IT help desk, uh, you know, just one of the technicians on the help desk. Uh, from there, I just kind of moved up in the ranks uh, to a network admin and then um, data center engineer and a couple of other various IT manager roles. And around um, uh, 2010, uh, I developed, uh, I started looking into the cybersecurity side. 
So um, went and um, studied for my CISSP, uh, Cup Security Plus, kind of some of the basic certifications. Um, went on to uh, uh, work in the cybersecurity field, uh, both on the civilian and the military side. Um, at the time, the, the military side was a little different. It was more the, the InfoSec uh, policy and uh, governance side. But uh, since that time, they've developed into the, the, the true cybersecurity of offensive and defensive operations. Um, about um, uh, back in August of last year, I was selected as the uh, commander of the Army Reserve Cyber Protection Brigade, uh, as you mentioned. And um, since that time, I've been developing all the, the training and uh, the uh, deployment opportunities for our soldiers to help protect the, uh, the nation from um, uh, cyber threats. So that's kind of just a, a quick wrap up of how I got into the, the cybersecurity world and, and my experience with, within uh, IT. So it's, it seems like with your military experience, you've done different kinds of tours of duty, uh, including a tour of duty on the help desk, which is always yes. uh, <laughs> a good place to start. Um, Bill, Bill, maybe you could tell us your story. Um, I, I enlisted in the Navy back in 86 in a six year program, electronic warfare as a technician. So, you know, really technical, we maintain our own equipment, uh, getting into the signals intelligence and, um, and that whole, everything that goes into that understanding, you know, you, you're picking up radar signatures and having to let the commander know what's out there and what their intentions are. And it, relied heavily on, you know, threat intelligence and, you know, who's in theater and, and, um, and so forth. So back then many limitations and, um, as far as on the computer side, but through the years, I just, you know, interest grew, curiosity grew, uh, got into computers back in the early nineties. Um, and then, uh, when I was, uh, I applied for the commissioning program halfway through my career, I was an E6. I was up for E7 um, and then made the choice to, to, uh, to get a commission and went into uh, computer science at Auburn University and started back then, there was really nothing on security, uh, cybersecurity. Um, as mentioned before, it was information security or information assurance. And information assurance is like the umbrella that covers all the security disciplines, but it depends on what you read. I mean, NIST has a whole bunch of information concerning what they they, they think um, cybersecurity is or information assurance, information security. But um, uh, as a commission officer, uh, not very hands-on. The Navy, it was new um, back in the late 90s. So uh, I went to the Air Force for, for four months and trained in advanced network uh, technology s systems, I think it was called. Uh, ANTS was the was how you pronounce the acronym, but it re it it took a a mid grade a junior a mid grade officer senior enlisted and took you from soup to nuts on how to manage a network and started to scra scratch the surface on security. So then uh, when I went in the uh, the Navy side uh, at the Naval Reserve uh, Forces Command. Uh, as an information assurance manager, which I guess is the equivalent of a CISO um, or a CISO today, um, reported to the CIO uh, for the for the Navy Reserve. A lot of training, more training I wanted at the time, but looking back, it was a blessing. Uh, so I got my CISSP and ethical hacking and, um, but focused mainly on the policy side and, and establishing a program, which is very important and what we do for our customers today. Um, I, the ethical hacking part, uh, you know, I went, I, I got, I was certified back in, I don't know, 2004, I think 2002 taught it for a few years and I just, I'd let it go. It's been well over 10 years since I've ever taught that class. It was a, it was an, a monster of a course to go through on the certified ethical hacking or to be a white hat. Um, so that was, uh, for me today, I, I don't, I don't have the skills, uh, I think I could brush off the dust and get back involved in, in some capacity. But the most important thing is the perspective and understanding that this is real and, uh, and, and understanding you know, the, the exploits and the whole hacking life cycle, which we covered. Um, I had my two master's degrees. The, the first one at Southeastern Louisiana University did my thesis on 
on vulnerability management for the Navy Reserve Force, and then to burn the rest or the remainder of my GI Bill. Uh, Regis University has a program that's fully accredited with the National Security Agency and um, Department of Homeland Security. And it's a really neat course uh, or program. So I have a Master of Science in that as well uh, and taught CISSP and ethical hacking for a couple of years. And in the private sector, healthcare has been my, my main focus. And uh, there's, there's a lot uh, in the healthcare space, but uh, I think across all the different verticals, um, there, there, as you mentioned before, it's, there, there's plenty of opportunity for uh, security um, professionals and, and they're hard to come by. I mean, in, in our own backyard, it, it's hard to find that, that, that type of talent. Then you hire someone, train them up, and then they leave and make twice as much as what they started. Right. Um, but uh, I think that pretty much covers uh, my background. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting what you say said at the end there. It is hard to find good talent um, in cyber, and therein lies the opportunity, right? And as we get for people looking to get into the, this field, and as we talk here, I'm, I'm going to want to ask you, you've got a really inter interesting perspective. You've got sort of both sides of the equation in terms of offense and defense. You know, you taught certified ethical hacking, and you're also a CISSP, so you're red team and blue team. But you've also got experience in what we call the cleared world, right? Uh, you know, for, former military, um, people with a, a security clearance, and, and the private sector. So I'm definitely going to want to, to tap into your, your expertise on, on that one. Before we do that, let's talk to Keeson. Um, and, and so for, for anyone who doesn't know... Uh, Keith, he's, he's a well-known um, hacker. Uh, you, you can Google him. He's got some incredible stories. Keeson, it's good, it's good to see you again. Um, what, for, for people who don't know, why, why don't you tell them a little bit about your, your background? Thanks, Mark. And uh, before I do, I uh, wanted to uh, thank all of our active uh, service members and former service members for their service to our country. Thank you very much. Uh, just thank you from, from our heart. Uh, it, it, from, from the hacker community, we do look at people uh, in the service community as a valuable asset to our country, and so thank you. Um, my name is Keith Andrade. Uh, I am uh, pretty much the real deal. I am a uh, former Black Hat hacker. Uh, I, uh, I'm you know, 48 years old. I got my first computer in 1983, uh, TRS-80 Model 2, you know, with a little floppy disks on the right. Um, Sort of, uh, sort of, you know, played around with the telephone system as a kid, you know, around 10, 11, that's when I got my first computer. Um, that even before modems were uh, connected to computers. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, the early 80s, 83, 84, and I'm using uh, 17 kilohertz uh, uh, acoustical modems to connect to what was then uh, known as the ARPANET, uh, which is now today's internet. Uh, and uh, I, I would have uh, uh, special access due to uh, uh, my family's military background. So I was able to play around on the ARPANET uh, sort of uh, in a special capacity, uh, which uh, led me to, uh, during the, the mid to late 80s, I was uh, hosting my own bulletin boards uh, online. Um, uh, just all, all the CompuServe, Prodigy, all of those old dial-up services back in the day, um, and just uh, meeting other other people who were interested in the telephone system, such as I was, uh, the reverse engineering the cellular system, uh, which is something that fascinated me by the time I was 14. Uh, by the time I was 16, I, I had the entire uh, first-generation cellular system pretty much memorized. It was called AMPS. It was an analog uh, system. And um, so I started to play around with that as well uh, in the, the mid to late 80s. Um, during that time, uh, around 87, I joined a, a club in Germany known as the Chaos Computer Club, which is a world renowned uh, computer club of hackers, free thinkers, and spirits as well. And I encourage you, uh, you uh, everyone on the call this evening, to check out the website at ccc.de. It's, it's a great opportunity to meet uh, other hackers and really uh, explore uh, the, 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 the positive side of hacking uh, rather than what the media has always portrayed. Uh, so I joined the CCC in the late 80s as well. Uh, met a lot of incredible people still to this day. Uh, I'm, I'm close friends with and uh, former colleagues as well. Uh, one, of, one of my friends at the CCC, uh, his name was Boris Florek. 
uh, and he was interested uh, in this type of technology called smart cards. Um, and everybody has one in their wallet today. It has a little chip on your bank card. And that fascinated me in the late 80s. Uh, and I really um, wanted to know how these things worked. And so I began, I began to reverse engineer what was called the crypto card. It was uh, Germany's pay. Uh, it, it, was, it was basically an all-in-one card to travel around Germany, uh, to, to make phone calls, um, all, all, sort of, all sorts of metropolitan attributes to the card. Sort of like um, uh, a pay pass card in a, in a major city today, uh, like a venture card, so to speak, in New York and LA and Chicago and so forth. And so uh, we, were interested in, uh, you know, we were interested in reverse engineering that technology. Uh, at the time, we were, we were following a gentleman uh, online. His name was Dr. Marcus Kuhn. Uh, and he, he too was, um, he, he was in the, in, uh, he, he was started publishing papers uh, on how to reverse engineer smart cards. And so we took his work and uh, used it to our advantage. And uh, at, at, by 1990, we reverse engineered the crypto card in uh, Germany. And um, it was kind of a thing. So uh, for a couple more years, uh, 1992, um, by that time, I'm, I'm living in Jacksonville, um, pretty much hacking everything in this city uh, and getting in a lot of trouble doing it. Uh, and so by the time 1992 came around, um, we decided, uh, my, my father bought a, a, a satellite system uh, and uh, he, I said, well, dad, what is this? And he's like, oh, it's direct TV and it's really cool. It's, you have this little dish outside and, and, and it's, it's super cool. And, it, and I, I was curious to how it worked, right? And so I, um, I, I, well, lo and behold, a smart card controlled access to the channel capacity that the system offered and the service offered. And so uh, my curios curiosity was uh, easily overcome. Uh, and so I began uh, logging the data stream from the satellites. Uh, at the time, those were Boeing 618 satellites. And um, I, I self-taught myself how under, I self-taught myself and with uh, Boris how to uh, decalculate um, spacecraft and, and their uh, their position in the sky, uh, geostationary orbits, and also the encryption systems used on those satellite transmissions uh, to and from Earth. And so uh, we used a, a device that we built called a, um, a season passive interface, which allowed us to actually view the data stream. And uh, after a couple months, we were we were pretty confident to open up the smart cards and we began, um, we began getting, we began giving our wares away, uh, for direct TV. Wares, um, right? Wares, correct. <laughs> and, um, so we published the code, uh, onto the internet, uh, you know, just as a fancy, uh, for free television, uh, at that time, uh, you know, I was 22, 23. And so it was, it was cool to watch all the pay-per-views and Mike Tyson fights for free and, so, um, and so we kept, we kept progressing as DirecTV kept uh, issuing new cards and new countermeasures for their systems. We kept defeating them and writing code and pub publishing it to the internet. And by the time uh, the late 90s rolled around, we were um, actually selling the code uh, and making um, uh, millions of dollars off of it. Uh, and it, DirecTV sort of paid attention and uh, caught on to that and um, they paid me a visit here in, in, uh, in Jacksonville and, um, it, 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 it was more or less a raid, right? They, they came in, they seized my equipment, they seized everything. Uh, and, uh, they more or less gave me a deal. Hey, you know, we could prosecute you or you could, uh, assist us in, um, helping secure the next generation smart card for direct TV. And so, you know, it really wasn't a hard choice. Um, <laughs> in fact, Packed a few suitcases, headed to Haifa, Israel, and worked on uh, several teams to combat the, um, that at that time was uh, existing satellite piracy uh, with um, Murdoch's organization, which was NDS, uh, and uh, a, a lot of other uh, interesting characters and in, um, companies involved uh, along the way. And so, uh, long story short, we, we uh, if you Google Black Sunday ECM for DirecTV, uh, you'll see exactly what sort of uh, what sort of uh, clever trick we came up with, and basically all of the pirates at the time they were running uh, software that had 
become so prevalent that millions of people were, were actually stealing the signal from DirecTV. And so, um, again, I worked on those teams in Haifa uh, at NTS to come up with a solution, a countermeasure for uh, satellite pirates. And so we came up with some uh, pretty clever ideas. Uh, we, we decided to uh, update the cards and make them dynamic. And to do that, we sent down um, meaningless updates uh, for the period of nine weeks to all of millions of satellite pirates here in North America, uh, Canada, and South America. And, um, well, Canada is North America, but nevertheless, we, we, we um, worked on the code, sent down the updates, and by uh, January of 2000, 2001, I believe it was 2001, we, uh, DirecTV fraud basically killed millions of cards with the code. And so uh, that was one of, uh, that was one of my, you know, Pretty cool achievements uh, coming through my career. Um, finished my stint at uh, NDS, came back to America. Uh, went to work at a little small newspaper in Indiana because I really had enough. Uh, and I was just thinking my lucky stars and I wasn't in jail. Um, got, kind of got bored of working at a newspaper. So I went on to Chicago, uh, joined a media company. Uh, I helped set up uh, their, their IT infrastructure along with security using satellites as their main, um, their, their main communications link, et cetera, uh, securing it, encrypting it as well. Uh, went to the CME after that, hung out with a, a bunch of rally crazy traders and clearing houses uh, there in uh, downtown Chicago. Uh, and about the time I discovered this little cool thing called Bitcoin, um, and I, I was really eager to grab as many as I could. So. Uh, with the help of several friends, we were able to raise about $50 million in capital and build four supercomputers uh, that were uh, that allowed us to mine, uh, allowed me to mine uh, over 76,000 Bitcoin. Uh, and so, um, uh, mined those for several years at CME, um, created some secure networks for uh, clearinghouses and trading firms and the CME themselves, uh, and uh, ha had a great time, had a great run. I uh, had to get out of there as well. The, trade, the, trading, um, the trading business is really a unique business. And so if you, uh, if, if, yeah, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, and so I uh, just worked for some more companies in Chicago. Uh, as I said, I was originally from Jacksonville, Florida. I had just moved back here uh, this past December. So I've been here six months. Uh, and, and as you can see, uh, there's not really too much furniture, <laughs> but um, I've got a seven foot computer over there, which is kind of something that I'm building, and so, um, so uh, yeah, um, I've got I'm back here in Jacksonville after um, being in Chicago for 15 years, 16 years, and you know, it's uh, yeah, and, and um, I'm working with a company called MTech, uh, a wonderful company, and um, they, they they were they were crazy enough and nutsy enough to hire me, and so. Uh, I've joined the company uh, here at MTech uh, in Jacksonville, where they just moved their home office to, and uh, I, I've uh, helped secure their infrastructure uh, and prepared them to stand up a security apparatus as well and offer services uh, here uh, locally and globally as well. And so uh, it's um, that's sort of my career and, and background in a nutshell. Uh, I've, I'm one of the most well-respected hackers in the world. Uh, I, I hang out with people you probably have read about. Uh, it's a fact. You can Google it. As Mark said, you can check it out. Uh, and um, and uh, with that said, I am uh, as well honored and humbled to be a part of this evening's discussion uh, here uh, with um, you guys and uh, with LSU. And so thank you for having me. You know, Keeson, it's, um, it's, you've got such a fascinating story, right? Um, and by the way, I, I would encourage anyone watching or listening to, to Google um, Black Sunday ECM. I mean, Keeson just gave us sort of the, the summary of it, but it's a fascinating story. Um, but I, I really liked the way you began your comments, right, by thanking people who have served the country, Benjamin and, and Bill. And I, I feel the same way. It's, it's really important to me. And, you know, I, I, that brings a couple things to mind. One is that um, the people that I've worked with from that sort of 
world, right, have been some of the most incredibly talented people that I've ever come across, technically talented. And matter of fact, there's a guy named Michael Cranch, and, and you guys can Google him, K-R-A-N-C-H. He helped us write our curriculum at the Cyber Boot Camp. He used to teach uh, red teaming at West Point, um, an incredibly talented uh, guy. Um, so so I, 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 feel, I feel the same way, and I'm, I'm glad you said that. Uh, Benjamin, you mentioned when, when we got started here, um, something about the Cyber Protection Brigade. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering if you could tell us, what is that? Oh, are you muted? Yep, I was. Sorry there about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, every service, Army, Air Force, uh, Navy, Marines, has uh, stood up a, a component uh, for their, their cyber uh, warfare, uh, both offensive and defensive. Um, the active component Army it has uh, several units. The, the main one is stationed at uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, and is comprised of um, what they refer to as a cyber protection team. This is about uh, 40 individuals, give or take. Uh, com um, there are di different uh, sections on the team. Um, you, you have your blue team, your red team, your threat intel, um, your uh, networking analyst, uh, just all different type of you know, job roles and responsibilities. And uh, the uh, active component has about 20 of these CPTs um, there at Fort Gordon. They have some more um, stations scattered throughout the U.S. and, and uh, overseas, but that the main hub is at Fort Gordon. Um, as an Army Reservist, uh, my unit is comprised of uh, 15 CPTs, and um, we uh, 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 are activated in support of the active component. So um, currently I actually have one of my protection teams, they're deployed to Fort Gordon and they're augmenting the work that the active component is doing there. Um, uh, they, they uh, as I mentioned, the blue team will do the um, securing of uh, the, the network. So uh, it's referred to as DODIN, Department of Defense Information Network. Um, they do the DODIN ops, uh, going out, making sure everything's patched, uh, they're, they're looking at all the logs to make sure that uh, any type of thing that goes bump in the night, uh, we take a look at and, and uh, look for indicators of compromise to make sure that uh, uh, if, uh, if there's a known indicator of compromise or IOC, if there's a known IOC out there and it pops up on a log somewhere, uh, they'll go and investigate it. And um, uh, probably the most interesting part about that is uh, location is independent. So. You can have someone that's stationed at Fort Gordon and they're looking at the log files of something over in Stuttgart, Germany and uh, responding to an attack that is coming from Iraq or China or, or Russia or whatever. Um, so, so that's kind of the defensive side is, is to make sure that the network is set up, that it, all the, the um, controls are in place and, and everything is protected appropriately, but then also watching and monitoring to, to look at all the activities to find those anal uh, anomalies that will indicate that somebody's in your network. Um, that's all the defensive side. For the offensive side, uh, that's, a, that's the fun side. Uh, that's where you actually uh, have people that will uh, do the hack back. Um, in the US, the, the uh, US government, uh, US Army is not allowed to conduct offensive operations on US soil. So all of our operations have to happen overseas in theaters of operations. So, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, um, China, Russia, so, something like that. Uh, so all these um, offensive operations uh, take place uh, from the, the European, typically the European um, or the Pacific uh, uh, theaters, but my soldiers are mainly uh, focused on Europe. Um, they will work with um, uh, the, the forces that are over there to, once they identify a threat, they will try to trace it back to its origin and um, either, uh, you know, uh, take steps to um, uh, find out more information on the, uh, on the attackers or maybe even take steps to infiltrate, infiltrate their network and uh, take over the network and, and basically, uh, you know, we hack the hackers. Um, the, there was an article that was published, uh, I want to say six months to a year ago that talked about uh, an operation that occurred against ISIS 
um, the, this, uh, this group, it was called a task force. It was comprised of more than just the army. It was all the services, plus some, some uh, government uh, agencies. Um, very big task force, multiple people, lots, lots of talented people. But they actually hacked the, uh, the ISIS network and uh, you know, uh, did, did all the, the social networking and uh, honey pots and, and all just the little tricks you get to find out people's usernames and passwords took over all the ISIS social network accounts and actually like started deleting their posts or posting uh, propaganda that's, you know, completely against what the ISIS was, uh, was wanting and uh, uh, started shutting down servers and accounts and, and really dismantled the entire ISIS uh, effort on the, the uh, on the internet. And yeah. uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why you, you, you haven't heard about that, you know, Two or three years ago, you heard the ISIS was posting videos and uh, putting out, uh, you know, all the propaganda. And um, in the matter of about six weeks, they've gone completely silent, and we haven't yeah. heard from them again. So um, stuff like that is, is that's the fun stuff that we do. That uh, um, you, typically that's happening from bases overseas because that's considered, you know, offensive operations. Um, but uh, uh, my soldiers will come into the unit. Uh, they'll get assigned a position. They'll train up. It typically takes about two years to become fully trained from uh, beginning to end. Um, and then uh, we get into a cycle that uh, every four to five years, you'll deploy on a mission in support of the active component. So this year, is, it's uh, Fort Gordon. Next year, it might be Germany. And the year after that, it might be Korea. Uh, we just kind of go where we're told. And, and when you know we set up shop, and they point us in a certain direction, and we go after them. You know, it's it's so fascinating to, to hear this stuff, right? And you talked about the attack on ISIS, right? Uh, and for anybody who's curious about that, you can Google, there was a, there's a podcast called Darknet Diaries, um, where they interview some of the people who were involved in, in that uh, attack. It's a really fascinating story. There, there are several fascinating things about it. Number, number one is that it's kind of the first time that sort of the veil has been lifted. Um, and the government has talked about, you know, offensive operations. Um, so that was really interesting. It was really interesting to hear that they went in through the social media accounts and pivoted into, you know, diff across the network and, and were able to infiltrate other areas. But it was also really interesting to me, um, you know, as, as pen testers, and Keeson can speak to this, but, um, you know, you, you plot out your moves, right? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and you kind of think about it in advance. But yeah, what, what you guys need to do is you, not only do you need, from what I understand from Darknet Diaries, not only do you need to plan out your moves, right, each step of the penetration test, the penetra the, you know, the attack, um, but you also need to get a, approvals for each, for, each, for each move. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, you know, Bill, you, t you talked about uh, when we got started here um, that back in the early 2000s, you were doing your ethical hacker training. Um, initially going through the CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker Certification, and then teaching it, right? Um, and now you're on the, you know, that, so that was red team stuff. Now you're on the blue team helping to, you know, defend organizations. But I'm, I'm curious about this thing that they call the security mindset. You know, one, one of my favorite security researchers is, is Bruce Schneier. Uh, and he talks about this a lot, how, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to be a good defender, I talked about this a little bit in the opening, um, you need to think like an attacker, you need to know the tooling they use. Um, and it's like a chess match, try and think two or three steps ahead. So I'm curious, in, in your experience, for people who are watching this and, and are considering getting into this field, is it important to, to, to learn uh, the offensive stuff to be a better defender to develop the security mindset? I think it is. And I have to say, it sounds like Benjamin's having a lot more fun than we are uh, <laughs> with the, the, the kind of stuff they're into. But uh, for us, yeah, I, I appreciate the training I went through and teaching it. And I wasn't the best. I'm not, I don't consider myself a hacker. I wouldn't dishonor the hacking community to, but I at least walk their path for a while. And I understand, you know, it's, it's a mindset for sure. Um, there's a definite methodology. I mean, most of your time, the good ones is, is doing recon, um, both passive and active recon. And there, there's just so much out there to gather. And, and you can, and there's, there's so many techniques that can be utilized. So going through that training, it makes you one real, I mean, the first, the first day teaching the ethical hacking was that shock factor that the, the class went, you know, when I went, when I sat through, you just would never think that, um, that it could be so easy. 
And not to suggest it's it's really easy. And and you know there are lots of script kiddies out there, and they can and curious minded people who like to poke around. But I mean there there are real professionals out there that could uh, really uh, put you in a hurt locker quick. So it's definitely it's definitely a good uh, it was a is a great experience for me. What I strive with all the education and certifications and everything else, if I can get to a point where I know what I don't know, I'm happy, you know, because right. you can't know it all and you surround yourself with good people and support them. And, um, but, but to answer your question, I mean, it's, uh, yes, that mindset um, and understanding, you know, for me, I, I got in a heated discussion today. We love to debate things and, you know, you get these security professionals, they're just so out of touch, right? They're so heavy handed on everything you want to do, right? And then so understanding what is the likelihood, you know, you're looking at risk, you're looking at your threats, you're looking at your vulnerabilities, you're looking at what you're trying to protect. And I think of it like a Venn diagram, you just, and it's an overly simplistic, but I think effective conceptually, you overlay those and you look for your area that's exposed, right? You look for the assets that you, you, and so many people don't understand the information, the value of the information they have and where it resides and how to manage that. Um, but that I had one security person, he's coming to all the doomsday scenarios and I'm like, everything leads to we do nothing, right? So there is no perfect scenario, but understanding, you know, from a likelihood factor and, under, you know, what it, realistically, what, you know, am I a high value target? Hopefully not, um, but a target. Um, I know there's some healthcare companies out there. They, they have 30, 50, 100 million patient records. That's a, I would say that's a high value target. That's worth the investment. You have billions of dollars of things that they can gather. Um, but to understand, getting back to your question, understanding that security mindset and, and um, just, and I, that, that Sun Tzu over the you know, know your enemy thing, I think that got overplayed yeah. quite a bit, you know, in all <laughs> the training, it seemed like the Sun Tzu part came into it, but know your enemy and know it's real. And so I think it's with, you know, doing your, doing your homework and hopefully knowing what you're talking about, um, being prepared and, and, uh, and having that confidence, that conviction yeah. and, and helping companies and start, start from a place where, I'm here to help them. I'm not here just to clobber them to death um, and fear mongering because that, that rarely works in business. You know, quoting Sun Tzu, uh, I love it. Know, know your enemy. And what, what's interesting about this field and people don't think about this sometimes is there is the notion of an enemy or an adversary. And, and that's rare. You know, you're not going to go into many fields where first of all, um, it's in the news and the headlines every day, but you also have an, an adversary, um, w which is unique to this to this field. Yeah, and for, for some people, the enemy, they're, they're their own enemy. They're their worst enemy. Right. And, you know, for me, I would not want to upset the, the hacking community out there or draw attention to yourself. I, I, one of the case studies we did in ethical hacking, I don't know if it's still in the curriculum, but there was this company, believe it or not, they would certify a business that they're hack proof, basically. Right, don't do that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, so our friend here on the panel, I'm sure he, he's like, oh yeah, we, you know, in no time, you're going to take him down. I mean, it's just a, you just don't, you, you, you want to uh, hopefully stay off the radar scope. And, and again, no, have a good sense of who you are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't say you're unhackable. That's like a, a red rag to a bull, as they say. Right. Uh, you know, I, I want to uh, encourage, we've got such a great panel here. Uh, anyone watching or listening, I encourage you to post your questions in chat. Take advantage of, of the opportunity um, to, to get your, your questions answered. And I, I am seeing a question here. Um, is AI being used for either offense and or defense? That, that's a great, great question. Keeson, you want, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. AI is being used in both areas, yes, for hacking and um, for de defense. Um, and in one of the most recent, uh, in one of the most recent uh, displays of that, uh, we, we've had several uh, insurance companies uh, across the USA experience uh, traumatic uh, ransomware attacks, uh, all devoted from AI uh, sourced attacks. Uh, and you know, it, it's it's a you know, in the past, it's previously been said that. Uh, you need fire to fight fire, and, and with AI, uh, it, that seems to be ringing true. And so, there's a lot of good companies out there that offer AI-based protection models and, and threat detection systems. Uh, and one of 
you know, I don't want to sound like a salesperson or anything, but one of the, one of the most interesting concepts uh, to date, I've actually found two are, are by uh, actually two companies. One is uh, a company called Cypraix, uh and another is by a company called Avocado. And both of their AI offerings are unbelievably remarkable in as far as understanding, understanding and displaying and alerting uh, with AI intelligence uh, of the most granular detail, such as uh, a specific application or script running uh, and connecting to a server somewhere that it shouldn't be. And so uh, there's a lot of companies taking advantage of AI and leveraging AI to uh, defend against most critical networks and infrastructure, with infrastructure rather. Uh, and um, it, it, it certainly is being used uh, right now this very minute. A absolutely. And, and the question is, you know, we, we talk about a lot of people talk about the automation of jobs and, and jobs going away because machines are going to take them over. And there's a great debate in InfoSec, particularly on the defensive side, right, about if SOC analysts, security analysts are going to be um, outsourced by, you know, or their jobs are going to be replaced by, by machines, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm in New York City, right? And there's an organization called New York City Cyber Command. Uh, and there's a great talk that you can go on to YouTube and watch. I can post a chat if anybody's interested, where uh, one of the people who runs that organization talks about how they protect New York City. And it goes into some numbers. And one of the numbers is that New York City gets uh, attacked, I'll use that in, in quotes, about 12 billion times a day by attack. I, may, I just mean an event, some sort of a ping coming in from a, a, a computer. In New York City, the people at Cyber Command have the challenge of filtering out the signal from the noise, right? If you've got 12 billion pings a day coming in, how do you figure out what are actually incidents, what are actually uh, attacks? And so you can have automated tools um, to try and filter out most of it, things like Splunk, right? But um, at the end of the day, maybe that 12 billion, you can filter down to two or 300 events per day that you actually need to have a human look at. Um, and and that's, uh, that's my take on it, is that yes, you can have AI and machine learning as an assistant, uh, but at least for the foreseeable future, we're still going to need humans uh, on the front lines to think through, through these things and, and teams to work on the incidents. And many of them, we, we, we need as many as possible because there are so many gaps in the cybersecurity space. Uh, that's, that's actually why one of, the, one of the core reasons we're having this discussion this evening. And so uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are, are most likely or probably put off by the threat of automation uh, and whatnot. But um, in, in the cybersecurity space, it's simply not, not true. Yeah, ag agreed. Here's another question. This one's, this one's funny. Um, for, for Bill, what are script kitties? Script kitty is uh, somebody who uses tools, uh, programs that are already developed by somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, somebody who can Google on how to hack, you know, you know, hacking 101 or, or how to run a script or an exploit. Uh, but they don't really know what's behind it. They can't add to it. That's, that's a script kitty. Uh, is, does that sound accurate? Is that it's sort of like a derogatory term, right? Well, it, it, yeah, if somebody's calling you a script kitty, it's usually not taken as a compliment. Yeah. But it, it's kind of a, it's a realistic, like you're not a trained hack. I mean, right. the, the one skill and I have for us, like we have network engineers. I mean, at, at, here at Transformix, I mean, we have CCIEs on staff. I mean, we have people who are very knowledgeable, but it's on the, on the application side, on the software is where, man, those are real critical skills. Uh, that and those are the ones that they understand this and they can put all the things together and, and, and the tools because this is so data rich. You're talking about the AI and, and, and helping to sort through all the data and to baseline your activity so I can, you know, I can remove the chaff and look at the real target. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. People talk about script kitties. It's a well-known expression. One of my former students came up with a Twitter handle, which I thought was quite hilarious. It's uh, at script doggy. Um, so, you know, you know, I want I want to talk about you know for for a lot of people who are watching, they're they're considering going into cybersecurity, specifically in Baton Rouge, specifically in in Louisiana. Um, so so Benjamin and Bill, I'd like to get your take on what is what does the security community look like uh, there? Um, who are some of the biggest employers? Who are some of the biggest you know? What are some of the biggest industries there? People are looking to get in, into this field. Benjamin, maybe maybe you could take that one first. All right, thank you. Um, so um, Baton Rouge is a, a pretty good field to get started in cybersecurity, as, as Bill mentioned earlier. 
Um, he, he has a problem where he'll hire someone and train them and then they'll, they'll leave. Um, that's a uh, very common in Baton Rouge. Uh, it is very easy to um, find an entry level position or maybe even uh, uh, you know, kind of a mid-level position here in Baton Rouge. Um, and uh, we, we refer to it as growing your own. So you, you take someone who doesn't have a lot of knowledge or experience and you invest in that person and you, you know, send them the training, you, uh, you give them the experience and special projects and, and uh, just uh, between time and effort, they become very competent in cybersecurity. Um, and then you know, the, the salaries being what they are in, in the Gulf Coast, um, they can make better money elsewhere and they end up leaving. Um, th there's a, a trend that I find that at least um, at my last employment, I worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana for about five years. Um, uh, I kept getting into discussions with the human, rela uh, rela human relations department about um, talent management and their market. Because uh, every time we did salary uh, analysis, they would always talk about the Gulf Coast and they would compare our salaries to like Houston or Orlando or, you know, Mobile or, or something that, that's along the, the Gulf South. And uh, I, I, I would always just retort back to them. I'm like, look, nowadays we have to look at worldwide salary market um, uh, with the remote work from home, uh, especially COVID now, everybody's working from home. So the, the ability for people to work uh, independent of their location is, is getting to a point that we have to be a, um, we have to be able to be competitive on the worldwide market. Um, so, so even if you reduce that just to, to na uh, national, um, I, I know uh, several people that have gotten positions, let's say in California, where the cost of living is much higher and the salaries are much higher. Well, they live here in Baton Rouge still and they fly out there maybe once a quarter, but they're getting paid, you know, California rates for, for salaries and living cost of living in Baton Rouge. And uh, it, it's, it's really a good advantage for them. Um, that the market itself here in Baton Rouge is, um, uh, I would say it's on the small side, but it's definitely something where uh, you can find your niche. Uh, healthcare, Blue Cross, it's definitely um, has its competitors. There are uh, uh, several uh, healthcare firms, large healthcare firms here who will uh, compete for the same talent in cybersecurity. Um, and then you get into all the other industries. Oil and gas is, is another big one that's, that's uh, got a lot of uh, corporate headquarters uh, either you know, here around the, the Baton Rouge area or New Orleans. Um, the, the, uh, the, the senior level uh, positions are a little bit harder to, to find around here. Typically, if you're looking for uh, something that's a, a director or a VP, um, they, they, they promote those from within. So if you're in the Baton Rouge area and, and you're looking for you know, a senior level position, you're, you're going somewhere else or you're working remote or something. So um, o overall, it's a, uh, I would say it's a very um, easy um, environment to find a job and develop the skills in order to progress. But to, to have a lifelong career in Baton Rouge, you're either working remotely or uh, you're gonna probably be moving on in five to, to seven years once you get all your, your experience under your belt. You know, you mentioned oil and gas. It made me think of industrial control systems, what we call I ICS, right? And I'm wondering, you know, as, as people get into security, they do their basic training and then they specialize in, in a specific niche, like a doctor would, would right? Um, and so I'm wondering, is there a lot of ICS type of work, uh, security work in, in that area? Yes, there is. Um, yeah. Bill um, or someone... Okay, um, so yes, there is a, a lot, but it's, I would say it's no more than, than the other disciplines. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, a small niche um, and typically the, uh, the, in, the industrial plants um, will um, employ a lot of those people. Uh, but then you can also find other niches like um, uh, you know, risk, uh, Bill talked about risk earlier. So risk analysts is, is something that is, uh, kind of a niche field. The, the Governance, Risk, and Compliance, GRC, uh, is another niche. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, uh, the, the pen testing. Uh, we have several firms that specialize in, in you know, the, the red teaming and securing the networks, uh, doing all the tests for, for the local companies. Um, financial institutions. We have a couple of uh, large financial institutions that uh, 
employ a lot of security people. Um, so, uh, th th you know, it, 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 you basically have to find your niche and, uh, you know, you, you can specialize it. You know, it, it, cybersecurity is, is very much like IT overall to where you, you basically have two flavors of, of people. You have people, the, the one type that specialize something, and they do it for 30 years and they can tell you that the smallest detail and, and they're, you know, every little thing about that one topic, but everything else they kind of know about, but eh, not so much. Or you can have a journalist to where they know a lot about a lot, but they don't have that depth that that specialist knows. So you kind of have to decide which one you want to be. Do you want to kind of like hop around and, and look at different things? Or do you just want to focus on, you know, database security? And that's all you do. And, you know, you, 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 uh, you become the, the, the sole expert, subject matter expert on that in your field. Well, Bill, it's like what you said earlier, kind of be comfortable knowing what you don't know, right? And, and in this field, there's so much breadth. Um, unlike most other fields, there's so many different areas you could focus in on. Uh, you know, that's one of the things we teach at the boot camp. We, we give people the, uh, the lay of the land. We cover most aspects of the breadth, but then it's up to you to figure out where you want to go deep in, into what particular topics. Um, but Bill, wh what, do you, what are you seeing in, in Baton Rouge and in Louisiana in terms of, you know, where's the most um, activity in terms of cybersecurity jobs? I think Benjamin did a, did a fine job kind of covering the landscape. Um, the big ones, uh, Blue Cross, Emeticis, I worked at Emeticis for a while. I know some of the folks over at Blue, Cro uh, Blue Cross. Um, uh, EQ Health Solutions is, is another one. They, they, they are software as a service provider and uh, actually got them high trust certified. The one thing I love is a challenge. When someone says you can't do something, I'm like, okay, all right, we'll see. <laughs> and I, that's, I don't know if that's being military or what, but it's just like you bring it. And it's hard. I, I, it's, not a, it's not a cakewalk, but it's, 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 you know, very stringent control requirements and, um, and, and helping a company adopt an information protection program and, and from your, your security plan to your, to your policies, to your uh, uh, process implementation, and then your measure and manage objectives all contained in one, in one package. It's a lot to cover. You have 700 control requirements. So there's a lot you can plug into that as was covered by Benjamin. So um, in the local area, I think, you know, I've looked, I think it's always healthy. And, and you know, I work for Transformix. So I'm, I'm happy, gainfully employed here. Uh, but you always keep your eyes open because I, the one thing I, I tell my people, you don't want to feel trapped. You don't want to feel like I have to work here. I have no options. I'm here because I want to be here. And it's a great place to work. Um, but we, we look out for talent and, and, and we, we brought someone in, uh, there's an apprentice program. Uh, they, uh, we brought someone in at 35, 36,000. I'll, I'll share numbers. And, uh, it was a six month transition going through some training. And then, uh, we put them and we have the positions we have here. And we're actually in the process of setting up a SOC. We're not 24, seven, 365, but we have our network operations center. And now we have what will be a SOC at some point. Um, so security we have operation center. security operate. I'm sorry, acronyms, <laughs> security operations center. And so we have the analysts, we have three different levels to an analyst, um, the engineer. Um, and then we have an architect, uh, a, a program manager, a project manager. And then the, uh, the, the, I fill the role of the VP and CISO, CISO. Um, and uh, so the person we brought in in this apprentice program uh, started out at, at the salary that I had mentioned. And uh, after the six months, we adjusted it to 45 and then quickly not further down the road is 50,000. So $50,000 in, in this area is not bad. When people come out of college, I mean, they're probably engineers struggling to start at that level, you know, electrical, chemical engineers, they may make more, I'm not sure, but you know, that's a decent salary. Uh, he took a position probably eight, nine months later in Maryland, making over 80,000 a year working for a government contractor. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot, it, it is dispersed. And with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, with, with, with COVID, it, yeah, the, this paradigm shift from, well, I guess we can work from home after all and, and not having that stigma, right? Just, just don't have your, 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 your spouse walking naked in the background while you're on video. Not that it didn't happen to me, but it was funny stories you hear as people are adjusting. 
or they, they don't mute the mic or something and, 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 you know, craziness, but, you know, people are feeling more and more comfortable, um, you know, uh, being on, uh, being, uh, working from home. So that's inter I never thought about the cost of living. So you get, you get the, what someone in California makes living in Louisiana, that might be a good deal there <laughs> and going out once a quarter, as, as you say, and, uh, and, and to, to stay in touch. But, um, you know, those positions that we, you know, breaking it down and I don't think it's anything genius. I mean, it's just what, 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 whatever you call them, the analysts, I think the analyst role is probably one of the most important roles because if the engineers and the architects fail, um, or, 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 or they, they fail in supporting the analysts, I mean, everyone fails. If they're not, if they don't have, you know, whatever they're looking at on, on, on the, on, on display, if they're in there in a, in a security operations center or just at their desk, and, and they're not getting that information, you know, or they're spending all their time working in these control silos, we call them, you know, I'm spending a ton of time trying to pull data out of vulnerability management solution here and cleaning up the data, you know, so from an ETL standpoint, extraction, transformation, loading that into some other framework, perhaps, as you know, you get into that management of data. Um, but if they're spending all their time running these reports and trying to figure out what's going on, they're missing so many other things. So I, I look at the engineer, is being a little bit more more advanced, especially on the technical side, probably some networking um, background or experience, uh, but they're there to maintain, and this is a foreign thing, I don't, I don't know if y'all would agree, but it's funny, it's ironic. We, we're focusing on all the client systems. I refer to client as like a Windows 10 machine and then your, your servers. We're focusing on that, but we miss the, the security controls themselves. So you have security controls, at least running on platforms that in itself is insecure because we forget about it, right? So ma making sure that we're doing maintenance on those things, uh, making sure the engineer is keeping it up to date, making sure that it's, it's, it's providing the right data to the analyst so they can focus on what they need to do. So we have some separation of duties. Uh, and then the architect's there to build it. Once it's built, it's done, right? And they're just there looking for the next best thing and kind of helping to reinforce what's been put into place. Um, but like I'd mentioned before, the, on the software side, that's one area that, it, you know, when doing pen testing, uh, we have a, we partner with a company called Lars out of Colorado. Um, they're, they're, uh, NTT is another one. Um, so there, there, there are firms out there who, who specialize heavily in pen testing. Um, but when you get into those finer, when you start sharpening your skills and, and, and really specialize in those areas, I think, you know, it's good to kind of, it's like a, uh, it's like a junior officer on a, on a Naval vessel at, in combat information center. You're going to start standing watch at a radar scope with your operations specialists, or you're going to spend time with your electronic warfare techs and they do their rotations. They're not the expert in those areas, but they get enough exposure to understand the whole operational flow. So when, you know, they, they become a tactical action officer, they know what's being told to them. So. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You know, you talk, you're talking about analysts, right. And I kind of think of analysts as like the ones on the front lines, you know, they're the ones, you know, monitoring all the, in trying to find, filter out the signal from the noise, but you also mentioned that you're building a sock, right. And um, that makes me that leads me to my next question. I actually want to ask all three of you guys this question, and I'm seeing a question in chat as well from, from Edmund. The uh, question is, when looking for a job post boot camp, how does the boot camp compare to the CompTIA certifications? So certifications, right? This is a hot topic in cybersecurity. There's no shortage of, of debate. Are they a good thing or are they a bad thing? So I kind of want to go around the room. Uh, Keeson, maybe you, you could get us started. W what do you think of, of certifications in, in terms of breaking into this field? Can they be a good thing? They can be a good thing, and, the, and they are, re, are, are a must and a required thing uh, if you want to work in sensitive areas uh, within government and private sector. Yeah, like in the military, for example, or DOD, you have to have Security Plus to even be considered, right? So, so uh, Benjamin, uh, when you're hiring people um, in your private sector work, um, do you look at certifications? Or are they important to you? And if so, which ones? So it, it kind of depends on uh, the, the job. Um, uh, they're kind of, you know, stratified uh, certifications. Uh, the one thing I'll say about them is um, they're not required, but um, 
if, if I'm going to consider you for a position and you don't have any certifications, I'm going to have to know you. I'm going to have to know the kind of work you do, the experience you've done. Uh, a certification allows you to demonstrate a base level of knowledge to people that have no knowledge of you whatsoever. So it's a good resume, hey, you can get past the HR department and actually to the, the hiring manager. After that, it's, it's, you know, that's pretty much all it's good for, but it is necessary. Um, it shows that you have that base level of knowledge. It's kind of like a high school diploma, you know? It, it's really hard to get a job without a high school diploma. GED will work, but if you don't have either, it, it's just, you're not get, even getting in the door. Um, as far as certifications go, Security Plus is like the baseline entry level. You've demonstrated that basic knowledge of security. Um, to, to, so it's a very much a, um, you know, a, a, a beginner's role. Um, then you can get into things um, that kind of show a diversity. You can get your Network Plus. Um, you might, might have a, a cloud certification, a generic cloud. Um, and then uh, you get into, uh, SANS has a lot that have very specific things. Like I, I remember someone talking about the certified ethical hacker. You know, that, that's a very specific role and a very specific certification. Um, so there's offensive, there's defensive, there's uh, any type of role you can think of, there is gonna be a, a certification for that. So the more certifications you have, you're showing a more broader experience level uh, or, or at least knowledge of uh, all the different environments out there. So if I'm looking for um, a defensive security guy, I'm going to be look, looking for specific certs. If I'm looking for offensive, I'm going to be looking for other certs. If I'm looking for a policy guy or, guy or gal, you know, different certs. So it just all depends on, on what I'm looking for. Um, typically in the federal government, the CISSP is like, the crown jewel of, of uh, the, the certifications. If you have that, um, it, it covers everything. Um, uh, the, the, the CISSP is typically referred to that uh, mile wide inch deep to where it shows you have a very good understanding of, uh, I think it's like 10 or 12 different domains that they uh, test you on and that you can show uh, proficiency in. Um, but it's a, a three hour test. And if you study really well and you know a lot of the basic concepts, um, you can pretty much pass it. But if you get into an interview and I start asking you questions and you don't demonstrate that knowledge or experience that I would expect from someone with a CISSP, then I'm going to kind of start questioning, well, how'd you get it? Did you just study it? Did you, yeah. you know, go to a boot camp and knock it out? And you really don't have the years of experience that, that I want. Um, I mean, so to, to get a CISSP, you have to have five years experience in industry. So, um, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that, that is, um, used as a, um, a yardstick. It, we, I, I would commonly refer to that as table stakes. Um, that, that is what you have to, to display in order to sit at the table. But if, if you want to go, you know, go for the big prize and the jackpot, you're going to have to do a lot more than just uh, show me a bunch of certificates. You got to have the actual skills, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I think some people take a, a cynical view towards certs. Uh, I'm one of them in, in many instances, right? Uh, however, I, I will say that, um, you know, you can use certs as like a hack, right? In, in terms of breaking into this field, right? If, if you're trying to break into this field and you've got the skills, but you don't have the experience then you can get a cert um, and you can hack the ATS, right? The applicant tracking system. Uh, if you have the SEC plus or you have, you know, whatever the cert is, at least you're gonna get your, your resume looked at. Um, and when you look at the more advanced certs, I think on the red team and blue team, I think the gold standard on the blue team is CISSP, like you say, and on the red team, it's the OSCP. Um, but but on the on the, uh, on the on the blue team side, the CISSP, like you mentioned, you have to have five years of experience, but there's a little hack you can do on that one, which is you can take the exam um, and pass it, um, showing that you have the skills pending your five years of experience, in which case the organization that grants that cert, ISC squared, will grant you something called ISC associate. So I'm curious, does that mean anything? Is, is that If you see an ISC associate come across your desk, does, does that mean anything to you? It, yeah, it, it means exactly what you said. They passed the test, but they don't have the years of experience. So if I'm uh, advertising a position that says uh, CISSP required, 
uh, you don't have a CISSP, sorry. That's, you know, a, a CISSP associate is not a CISSP. So that, you know, that sometimes is a difficult discussion to have, but it, it's kind of like, you know, are you pregnant or are you not? It's, it's not a, a yet, you know, there's no in between. Um, but uh, if I'm, um, you know, advertising for uh, a, a security consultant and I say security plus is required, and you say you have a CISSP associate, I'm like, hey, you know, right. I can work with that, right? right. You, right. you have a little bit more than what I required, but yeah, you're, you're, you're not a CISSP. That's a, that's, a, that's a great way to look at it. Bill, I'm curious to get your take too, because you have a CISSP as well. I have a lot of letters behind my name, and they don't <laughs> mean, uh, you know, the CISSP, I, 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 it was one of those things, but I remember back in 2000, uh, as a Lieutenant JG in the Navy, I was an O2, and I was sitting through the Information System Security Manager course, a month long course at NTTC Quarry Station. And a gentleman, a former CT by the name of Norm Beebe was so proud as a peacock that he got a CISSP. And I was like, you know, me, I was like the young Padawan, like, oh, how do I get one of those? And he's like, oh, no, no, this is gonna take you forever and don't even think about it. So there, there we go, one of those challenges, oh, really? Um, but it took a while. I, I don't. I don't believe in the test prep, relying on on those little exam prep things. Back then, they didn't have them. Um, I was at the Marriott Hotel in New Orleans for about almost six hours taking that exam, and it was. It's a. It's. It's brutal. That the one thing I have nightmares about is letting it expire, you know, and having to retake the exam. So that and my PMP are the two hardest exams. But then there's the C risk, C guy. Please don't ask me to break down those acronyms. But it's just by virtue of being in this field and they were new, the ISACA certifications, uh, the, the CISA is another one in, in the ISACA space. Um, and then uh, certified scrum master to me was a good cert for me uh, on, uh, on, on how to run the projects as sprints. And, and there's a whole methodology of how to, uh, how actually we utilize quite a bit of that in this environment. Um, but and then the certified ethical hacker sat through the course at New Horizons and studied. And then we just, we, we took it and uh, I couldn't pass it today if I went in. So I won't pretend, but like Benjamin was saying, I, I think it's a gauge, you know, it, 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 there's a baseline that uh, understanding, you know, like the CompTIA, I love the CompTIA certifications, like security plus, I used to teach that in network plus, um, it just shows that it's a, it's a vendor neutral certification and shows that you, you're, you're, uh, you should be trainable. You know, it's like having a college degree. What is it? Co I have two master's degrees. They're overrated, right? It, 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 but it does demonstrate that I stuck to a curriculum and, and, and having a master's degree that I can do research, which is very helpful and, and, and written communication and so forth. So there is some benefit to it, but, um, you know, it just shows, I guess, aptitude, um, and the ability to commit to something, uh, the certification, yes, can show, can demonstrate in a certain area that they have the proficiency. Um, I knew somebody who he argued with me about certifications that they're worthless and yeah, he doesn't have any, right? So it's easy to say that, or he doesn't have a degree and he struggles to find a job. You know, he has no degree, no certifications. And like Benjamin was saying, unless you, you don't know somebody, if you don't know them, yeah, that's a lot of risk that you're taking to bring someone on. Uh, so they'd have to have a, like a, a, a slam dunk interview um, to even to have a shot. Um, so I, I think the certifications, um, yeah, they have, they have, it, it has its place in DOD. I have someone working for us on a government contract as a security analyst, uh, cybersecurity analyst. And I mean, CISSP, he had to have that, and um, there's 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 a few other other certifications that go into it. Plus, it's clearance. Um, so, you know, you know uh, I, I could speak to you guys for hours. Uh, we, we are going to need to start wrapping up um, at some point here, but I do want to do a, a couple more questions, um, and I, I want to wrap up. The last question I want to ask is for any advice you would each give to people who are looking to get into this field. But before we get to that one, I'm seeing a, a question in the chat from Kenneth. Uh, would an undergraduate degree give you a higher position to start? 
Um, and, and this is a this is a really interesting question because uh, you know in, in some of our boot camps we're we're starting to see people um, t take this kind of a boot camp as a college alternative, um, and oftentimes they'll get hired right after they they come out of the boot camp. But but I'm curious to see what you guys are, are seeing. Is an undergrad degree um, important, uh, or or is it more important that you have technical skills or both? Keeson, maybe maybe you could take that one first. You need both. You really do. And if you if you don't have both, you really need one or the other. As 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 Bill and ben, Benjamin just spoke up, uh, you, you you really you really must have to demonstrate the chops, the technical ability to to prove yourself into what what specific um, niche uh, within cybersecurity that you you're choosing to enter into. And sometimes, even if you don't understand what what actual vertical or, or niche in cybersecurity that you're you're choosing to enter, and you enter and you find that something else uh, within within the scope of cybersecurity appeals to you, then uh, take advantage of that because that's where your experience is going to be most limited and most addressed, and, and of course most helpful uh, to not only you and your career, but also to your employer and to who, who you're yeah. working for as well. So. Uh, and, and the, you know, long, long story short, yeah, uh, both, but uh, start with the technical ability and also start with the drive, right? It just doesn't begin with what you know and what you plan on knowing or whether or not you have a CIS certification or not, you know. Uh, it, it all depends on your focus and your attitude and your willingness to, to enter into something uh, exciting and that's going to take care of you and your family for a long, long time. And so... Uh, consider consider those options when when you're looking at uh, all of your options. Yeah, looking at all of your options exactly. And you know, one thing that I like seeing in students who have an undergrad is it shows a discipline and a commitment over a long term to, to stay focused and, and to get a degree. Benjamin, how about how about you? Is is an undergrad degree important? So I always equate it uh, like like both of my fellow panelists have said um, to uh, time, experience, and um, you know the ability to learn. Um, it, to, to me, it, it's kind of like a time, time value, uh, uh, time, time value, of money value of time, I should say, uh, you know, a boot camp that's 12 weeks long, um, and costs, you know, 10, 12, $15,000. Okay. That's, that's a good start, right? Um, a college degree that's four years long and costs $50,000. Well, obviously that's going to hold more value than, you know, 12 weeks and 12, right? You know, it's just, it, you're comparing apples and oranges. And, and if, if you get a college degree, it shows that you've at least applied yourself for four years. It may not all be in cybersecurity, but you have at least two years of, you know, very focused education on at least IT skills. And, um, the, you know, so, so if I had to pick between someone with a lot of certs and, and a college degree, I would say it would come down to the interview that, uh, you know, if I'm asking them questions and, uh, you know, they, they, they don't know the concepts that I'm talking about, I don't care what they, what, what's behind the name. Um, you, you have to be able to, to demonstrate that the proficiency in, in the art and the science of, uh, of cybersecurity. And probably the, the biggest thing I think that uh, anyone who wants to get into this field needs to have is a desire to learn. Because the moment you stop taking classes or certifications or education, that's the moment you become obsolete. And I've been in this industry for 20 years, and I'm, I'm studying for my next certification, you know, starting next week. And um, kind of like uh, Bill said, I got lots of name, lots of letters after my name. I don't uh, attribute a whole lot of, um, uh, of uh, importance to them, but they definitely helped me to have certain conversations. And they demonstrate that over the past 20 years, I've continued to learn yeah. and, and make sure that I've stayed current with whatever you know, efforts that, that I'm going for. So, so that to me is the biggest thing that you need yeah. to have if you're going to get into this field is you, you cannot stop learning. And continuous learning, right? In this field that's moving so quickly, the threat environment is changing all the time, right? And, and so you have to continuously learn just to stay on top of it, but you also have to be a good learner and you have to love learning, right? If, if it's like a chore, well, that's, you know, maybe this isn't the right field for you, but if you love learning, um, then that's an important indicator for, for success. Bill, how, how would you answer that, that question about, about an undergrad degree? I'd like to first start with um, 
you know, I think the, a good cybersecurity professional, um, ethical hacker, white hat is a, a good at critical thinking, problem solving, uh, very uh, highly driven, um, that, that fire in their belly, loves a challenge. I mean, because you can help, you can always pull stuff together and, and, and then that there comes the, the training and the exposure and the experience. Um, a degree I think is, uh, is good to have. My son, um, I did 20 years in the Navy, retired in 06. My son is, uh, he's Army. I forgave him a, a, a while ago. Uh, you know, I, I love him. I mean, he, he made a great choice. Um, but uh, I don't know, nowadays they get like 80 grand for their GI Bill or something like that. I got like $10,800 when I was in. But if I was him, I would go to a boot camp like this, like, like, like you know, the, the, the six month and just really absorb everything. And then, you know, work on maybe an associate's degree. And, and, you know, cause the degrees come in when you when you go to management positions, you know, it just shows a certain level of maturity, dedication, not that you have to have a degree to be a manager. It's like the whole MBA thing. I used to teach at college at, at Southeastern. Uh, I was an adjunct, adjunct instructor, um, actually wrote the information assurance co course uh, in the computer science department um, for Dr. El Cotti. Um, but, uh, you know, and have having, you know, having taught um, in, in college and, and, um, and, but, but having, oh, my point was, I kind of lost track for a moment. The whole thing with the MBAs, you know, you get, you get students, they go, they go to school, they get their business degree, whether a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science and Business Administration, and then turn right around and get their MBA, worthless. That MBA is for like an engineer or a technical person who wants to go into management. That's what the MBA is there for. Um, but having a degree, I think is, I think it just shows, again, shows commitment. I know in the military, usually a degree is required to have a commission. Um, and so they, they hold that as one of those, one of those, uh, benchmarks. Um, but, uh, but the training that, that, that you guys have in this bootcamp, I think that's, that, that to me would be a, 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 if I, if I could go back and, and, and start in something like that for like six months and just have, just really take my time and absorb and hone my skills and, um, uh, man, and, and then, and then you'll, the other stuff will come, uh, but to hold out first to get a degree to do all that, I, you know. Yeah. I agree with both you guys. I like the, the mix of, you know, like a, a, the technical skills and a degree. I think that's, that's a powerful combination. Um, all right, la last question. Um, so, so think about the, the people who are watching and listening, you know, they don't know too much about cyber. They're, they're exploring, you know, they're considering getting into this field. There's more questions than answers at this point in terms of training modality and what niche you're going to go into. But if you could sum it up, guys, uh, what advice would you give to someone who's thinking about going into this field, you know, looking back to when you broke into this field, what, what do you wish you, you knew? Keeson, maybe, maybe you can start us off. Just do what you find is within your heart, right? If, if you find that you feel that it, it's right for you, then pursue what feels right. Uh, if, you, if you're entering into cybersecurity just for a paycheck, then perhaps it may be right in that perspective. But uh, if you're not feeling it, if it doesn't feel right within yourself, uh, you, you know, you can tell. And if it feels right, then uh, go all in, right? Jump right in, uh, and and uh, and there's no no such thing as over immersion. Uh, just just ask many questions, read read as much as you can, and uh, never be afraid to ask questions. And and if anyone does call you a skitty or a kitty, just take it as a compliment because that tells yourself that you're you're beginning to learn that you're that you're using tools that someone else wrote that you're interested in or that you're fascinated in, and so. It comes with the territory. Trust me. Back in the day, I was hey, I was so yeah, I was drunk through the mud. But find what find what's best for you and what makes you happy, and then I think everything else will follow suit. If it feels right, I, I think that's, that's right. a great a great way to put it. Benjamin, how about you? Um, I would uh, just echo the, the comments. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, life is about uh, balance and about passion. And uh, um, if you cannot be a passionate about the, the work, about the learning, about the, uh, you know, the 
ability to not, not just the curiosity, but it, it's like it's required to be curious to, to be in cybersecurity. Because if, if you see stuff that goes by that's kind of unusual and you go, huh, look at that, and you don't investigate it, that, that's, you know, it's, it's it, you're always having to, to look for the unusual. And um, uh, to me, that, that that's the curiosity. So, you know, you got to be curious. You, you got to be willing to learn all the time. And, and you got to be passionate about about what you're doing. So um, cybersecurity is, is so broad. You know, if you want to be an auditor, you can be, you know, there's IT auditors and cybersecurity auditors. If you want to be an engineer, we got those. If you want to be a program manager, you know, working on projects, if you just want to be a manager, you know, it's just, it, 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 there's really something for everybody, um, but you have to be willing to, to put in the time to learn the, the, the profession. And that's, you know, that's true of any profession, right? You, doctors, lawyers, policemen, you know, firemen, nurses, everybody's got to learn the profession. So, so really just decide, is this your passion or not? Right. Thank you. Is, right. Because you have to be passionate to be successful over the long term. This has to be something you, you are really into. Bill, what advice would you give? It is a calling because, you know, I, for me, I enjoy, I mean, I, I have my moments where I just want to, you know, I look at someone stacking boxes and I'm like, wow, that looks interesting. You know, <laughs> you could start and finish a task and feel like you're done. Check. And so many times you end your days wondering, what did I do today? You know, there's so much going on. Um, but I love it. You know, it's, it's, uh, I remember my wife when I was still active duty Navy, she's like, you need a cert, like you need a hole in your head, another cert, I'm like, come on. But I was always studying, but it was something that I enjoyed doing. Um, I'm an MIS major management information systems. So I'm on the data sides so that fascinates me. I'm, I'm more of an analyst than I am an engineer and architect. I, I, I love bringing it all together. Um, uh, so when it comes to even the, the analytics side and the, and the business intelligence, um, and running like the BI stack and SQL Server, for example. I mean, I, you know, that's something I really enjoy because it's bringing it all together, right? And it's it's bringing perspective and added dimensions to this. So rather than look at just an IP address or a host name or whatever, I can bring all this other metadata to understand like what I'm looking at and kind of see things in a different reality. So that's kind of a little peek into how I think. And and, and, and you look at the, the virtual side of things and how it's almost like the, it, it there's it, it, almost like a spiritual component because this is, you know, you have this world here where people operate, but it's the same rascals you see every day in the, in, you know, in reality, in this reality, you know, but it's on the virtual side and all the, the psychological warfare and all the stupidity that sometimes you see. So there, and I just kind of flirt, uh, tease with that is that there's so much you can dig into. Um, but you just, I think it's a calling. It's something that you know, you enjoy doing, right? If you don't enjoy what you're doing in life, why do it? And yeah. the money is there, but it's there for a reason. If it was easy, a lot, many more people would be doing it. It's a calling. Yeah, I like that. And I think that's, that's a great note to end on. Um, Bill, Benjamin, Keeson, thank you so much for, for joining and spending some time. I, I think uh, the, the knowledge, the experience that you've shared has been really useful uh, to people who, who are watching um, and hopefully maybe in, inspiring to people to, to go into, into this field. Um, and to anyone who, who's, who's watching, if, if you are considering uh, going into this field, you're doing the right things, right? You've just spent an hour and a half with us learning, do more of that, right? Um, watch more of these, these types of panels, do your own research, check out all your alternatives, right? If you think you want to go into cyber, then look at all your alternatives, masters, undergrad, self-study, boot camp. look at all of them and stack them and, and decide what, what's best for you. Um, if you're interested in the LSU uh, cyber boot camp, then I would encourage you to come to the, you know, the information session. Um, we're going to send you an email tomorrow with a video replay of this event and also a link um, to the info session. So I would encourage you to go to that and, and learn more about the boot camp and if that's a, a good option for you. Um, so guys, why, why don't we leave it there? Hopefully we'll, we'll talk again soon, uh, maybe one of these days in Baton Rouge. Really appreciate you making the time tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night, guys. Bye. Good night. Good night.